coming up. Luxury caravans built for the Australian outback. Tuning forks that deliver perfect pitch. Ice resurfaces for smoothing over the cracks. And France's Festival of Lights. The greatest light show on Earth. How do they do it? Caravanning. The joys of holding up traffic, braving bad weather, and doing your business in a bucket. Not anymore. These days, campers tow luxury caravans through the Australian outback, rivers, even the desert. These caravans are supposed to offer Australian men a kind of mix between camping and a weekend in Vegas. But they cost up to $190,000. You could buy a Ferrari for that. If you want to off-road in style, then one company builds extreme caravans with everything from a beer keg to a poker table. They call it the Mobile Man Cave. What happens in the Man Cave stays in the Man Cave. How do they do it? <laughs> Melbourne, Australia. Here at Elite, head honcho Peter Smith and his crew make caravans tough enough to take on the outback. Australia's got some of the harshest environment in the world and some of the roughest roads. The machines Peter builds are designed to be pulled at speed across terrain that would be a no-go for most caravans. In 2014, someone managed to go 227 kilometres per hour in a motorhome. That's 141 miles per hour. That particular vehicle had a sink, stove, double bed and a toilet. Now that's what I call life in the fast lane. An off-road caravan tough enough for the outback needs a super strong chassis. So they build them from four millimetre thick toughened steel, far thicker than your typical touring caravan. Robots weld the steel skeleton together with pinpoint accuracy. Then a team of masked humans finish the job. Every element is designed with the tough terrain in mind, right down to the handbrake cable, which they thread through the frame. Instead of running on the outside, where you can have uh, either a stick or a stake, if you're off-roading, it may come up and tear your handbrake cable away. There's actually no chance of that happening because they're all internal. Fully loaded, the trailer will shoulder up to 4.5 tonnes and it takes 16 hours to make a chassis strong enough to carry all that weight. The first caravan designed for leisure was built in 1885 by a retired British doctor who wanted to tour the country in style. It was pulled by a horse and was fitted with bookshelves and a cabinet for China. Broken China, presumably. With the super steel chassis complete, next they build the frame from wood. Wood might not sound like the toughest choice, but this frame is extremely strong. It's made from a hard-wearing wood called Maranti that comes from the tropical forests of Southeast Asia. The trouble is, Maranti is almost too rigid. The solution is to build the frame using interlocking finger joints that can flex when you're bombing through the outback. PVA glue is used to bond the walls to the frame. Once the completed walls are mounted on the chassis, the next problem is up top. Temperatures in Australia can reach 50 degrees Celsius, which can turn your man cave into a man barbie before your first brewski. The answer? These special insulating rolls of material, which help to control the temperature inside the caravan. Right now, the caravan is just a skeleton. It needs an aluminium skin. This tough, 
lightweight cladding is resistant to hail, sandstorms, anything Mother Nature or frustrated drivers throw at it. With this, she'll be tough enough to tow through the bush. But that brings its own problems. In the outback, you can go for weeks without seeing another soul. There are no campsites to hook up your power. And if your battery dies, you could be next. Elite solution, the Armageddon Pack. It may not look much, but this is the mother of all fuel cells, capable of generating 2.5 kilowatt hours of electricity a day. This thing, you never have to plug it into power, never have to charge it. We've got customers out there that swear by it. Using solar panels and this newly developed bit of tech, you can live off-grid for up to six months. The fuel cell uses methanol, which reacts with oxygen in the air to produce carbon dioxide, water, and most importantly, electricity. Every one of Peter's caravans is bespoke. You want a poker table? You got it. You want a giant TV? You got it. You want weird flashing disco lights? Hey, it's your man cave. The finished caravans come with a warning. When you off-road for days on end to the back of beyond, it's a long way back to the nearest store. Where's the beer? I thought you were bringing it. No they were nowhere. No way, they didn't even show up to play. If this sounds in tune to you, then you need one of these. A tuning fork. The brilliant vibrating tool that's been key to perfect pitch for hundreds of years. Tuning forks can vibrate more than 5,000 times a second, which is about 70 times faster than a hummingbird can beat its wings. Without this mini metal marvel, musical instruments would never hit the right note. How do they do it? You going to mug me? I might get a mug you. It's that gorgeous one, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. Sheffield, the steel capital of the UK. And noteworthy for boasting the only tuning fork maker in the country. Here at Rag Tuning Forks, they've produced perfect pitch for the better part of two centuries. Production manager Bob Holmes is in charge of this finely tuned machine. The company's been making tuning forks since the 1840s. And I don't think a lot's changed in the process since then. And I think it's a case that if it's not broke, don't fix it. The point of a tuning fork is to make a sound at one particular note or pitch. This gives musicians a reference point, which they use to tune their instrument. And the search for the right note starts with a length of steel. A tuning fork needs to produce a single clear tone. That's why we use hard metals like steel. Softer metals like gold or tin would barely make a sound. Mick Hudson feeds the steel into a press that was made in the days of Al Johnson and Duke Ellington. This 90-year-old instrument needs a delicate touch, but Mick is a maestro with the foot pedal. With a push of his right peg, a die in the press uses 70 tonnes of pressure per square metre to punch out a steel blank. The blanks are a bit rough, so they're passed to Richard Rawson and his belt sounder. He eases them onto a conveyor that carries them under a rotating belt, which smooths the edges in a process called flatbed linishing. Yep, it's linishing, not finishing. To linish something is to grind it or sand it flat, and once you've linished, you're not quite finished. Next, a stamping machine engraves a frequency designation on one side and the company name on the other. After being heat treated to toughen them up, it's time to jam. On a liquid cooled grinder. Richard here is busy fiddling with the length of each prong. By doing that, he's tweaking the speed at which they'll vibrate, so changing the note they'll produce. 
to size here because we need to designate frequency. Depending what frequency determines the length of the fork. The shorter the tines of the fork, the less distance they have to move and the faster they can vibrate, which means that changing the length changes the frequency. The problem is the cut forks aren't smooth. They need a little more linishing. Take it away, Dave Frakovich. A hot session on Dave's linisher and the forks are smooth, but not smooth enough. So it's time for a solo from the Vibro Polisher. This rotating river of plastic chips smashes against the metal, bumping, grinding and massaging away imperfections until it's smooth as a Coltrane solo. As they jitterbug out of the Vibro Polisher, the forks are looking good. But they're still tone deaf. They need fine tuning from the master. Richard has been honing tuning forks for nearly 50 years. He places each one in a frequency reader. To match the designation stamped onto the handle earlier, these forks need to be 440 hertz, which produces the note A above middle C. 440 hertz means that the prongs of the tuning fork are moving back and forth 440 times every second. And with each vibration, they're slamming into the surrounding air molecules, creating a sound wave. The same thing happens when you pluck a guitar string. If the frequency doesn't match exactly, Richard has a few tricks to adjust it. There's two things you can do to tuning fork. If it's too high, you have to fire them inside. If it's too low, then we shorten them. All tuning forks get higher as they get shorter. The next problem is that rust could ruin the tuned forks and render them useless. The solution is a swim in something nasty. This vat contains potassium nitrate and sodium nitrite heated to 375 degrees Celsius. Liquid lacquer adds a final protective coating, and a dab of paint highlights the frequency. Now they're just the ticket to keep budding virtuosos in tune the world over, from grand pianists to guitar heroes. Still to come, the coolest machine in ice hockey, and the inside story on the world's biggest bulbs. How do they do it? Ice hockey. It's one of the fastest games in the world. They wear all that protective gear for a reason. Those pucks can travel at 100 miles or 160 kilometers an hour, which is easily enough to kill you. But everything would grind to a halt if it wasn't for the ice resurfacer. When the play stops, this cool customer turns the pitted, scarred surface into gleaming super smooth ice. How do they do it? Ice skating has been a popular pastime for centuries. The world's oldest ice skate is over 5,000 years old. It was found at the bottom of the lake, so I guess it's also evidence of the world's oldest ice skating accident. Almost as soon as the first artificial rink opened in London in 1876, they discovered a problem. It didn't take long for skaters to carve up the surface, and it could take an hour to resurface a rink. And that's where this machine came in. This is the Model A, Frank J. Zamboni's first working ice resurfacer, built in 1949. Frank proudly put his name to the design, and now his son Richard is head of the family business. It's a funny name, a little bit different from anything else, or Smith or Jones or whatnot, but it uh, has really been very nice uh, associated with it. I think it catches people's attention because there's not a lot of other things happening at the same time. 
Today's resurfacer looks as if it's just sweeping the ice, but it's doing a lot more. The machine's cutting edge is a lethal two-metre long blade, sharp enough to slice a bagel. This machine is like a giant wood plane, but instead of just smoothing a few boards, it's got to do the whole rink, and it's got to do it in just a few minutes. Watching a Zamboni is kind of hypnotic. Charlie Brown once said there's three things that people like to stare at. The first is a rippling stream, the second, a fire in a fireplace, and the third, a Zamboni going around and around and around. Just behind the blade, this spinning screw draws the ice shavings into the middle. And a vertical screw carries them to a bin on the top. Each resurfacing shaves off about 1.7 cubic metres of snow. That's enough to make more than 3,600 slushies. But removing the ice is just the first step. Next, it cleans the surface, then sprays it with hot water. This loosens the ice so it forms a nice even layer when it refreezes. Right, I know this sounds completely crazy, but hot water actually freezes faster than cool. Here's a trick you can play on your friends. Take two glasses of water, put them in the freezer. One hot, one cold. Which one freezes first? Incredibly, the hot one freezes faster. And it's a trick that helps the ice resurfacing team when they're working against the clock. Don't ask me why, there's a lot of complicated theories, but no one really knows. Once its journey is complete, the resurfacer heads out to tip the snow down the drain and refill its water tanks. So now we know how it works, it's no surprise that fans are obsessed with what they call the Zamboni. You can't have hockey without the Zamboni, and you can't have intermission definitely without the Zamboni. I'm crazy about it. Anybody that doesn't like a Zamboni, there's something wrong with them. Run out of sights to see in France. Been up the Eiffel Tower. Checked out the chateau. Well, here's a bright idea. Why not visit Lyon? It's a grey day, but all will become clear tonight. When France's second largest city hosts the greatest light show on Earth. Lyon's Festival of Lights is awesome. It's right up there with the Rio Carnival and Munich's Oktoberfest as one of the three biggest parties on the planet. Four million visitors, three million bulbs. How do they do it? Not much good came out of the bubonic plague. But Leon's Festival of Lights traces its origins to the dark days when the plague hit Europe in 1643. The plague was a pretty regular occurrence in medieval Europe, but in 1643, the folks of Leon made an offering to the Virgin Mary. Their town was free from the plague for the next 150 years. This festival is their way of saying thank you. <laughs> that homage continues every December. But the candles have got a bit bigger. a.m. on the banks of the Rhone, and lighting wizard Severine Fontaine is busy preparing her installation of eight giant light bulbs. These light heavyweights will knock out a six-minute synchronized set on a loop as one of the main events of the evening. This is just one of 75 installations that will light up Leon like the 4th of July. Do you know how sometimes when you have to sneeze and you can't and it's really annoying? Well, next time try looking at a bright light. You might have something called the photic sneeze reflex. It could work for you. Up to a third of all people have it. Severine's showpiece is this eight meter high monster. First, the team has to blow it up, in a good way, because the bulbs are inflatable. And despite appearances, these bulbs are energy saving too. Stitched into the fabric of each one are hundreds of tiny Philips LEDs. You would think a show like this would have a huge electricity bill, but no. 
Because LEDs are so efficient, the whole four day festival only cost about 4,000 euros, which is about $4,000. While Severin gets ready to hit the on switch, in the road tunnel beneath Perash Station, Jonathan Richet and David Alexandre Chanel are up against it. They've just a few hours to convert this tunnel into a kind of super-sized cinema. This station is called Cinematic Journey. It's about like a journey uh, through the history of image and cinema. Cinema was actually invented in France. One of the first movies simply showed a train pulling into the station. The audience was so terrified they ran out screaming, which was my reaction to The Notebook. But this cinema screen is 100 meters long. Lighting it up requires something a bit more sophisticated than the sort of old-fashioned projector familiar to film pioneers, the Lumiere brothers. The solution is not to use one projector, not two or even three, but 16 separate projectors. The projectors are linked together by four media servers. And now, the 64,000 watt question. Will it be all light on the night? Darkness falls across Lyon. And it's showtime. David and Jonathan fire up the projectors and thousands come to see the tunnel transformed into a kaleidoscopic journey through the history of cinema. While back at the river, Severine's super-sized bulbs light up the room. Across the city, the other installations paint the town red and every other colour of the neon rainbow. And the visitors flock to Leon like moths to a flame. <laughs> <laughs> 